And you see, the crossing here was caused by the out-of-plane motion of the C2, of the carbon-2 out-of-plane. From the free conic test section that I mentioned before, you see that this simulation shows that this one here is the one that caused the conic test section. This one here was responsible for the, for the crossing, for the internal conversion. One trajectory is not enough to give, to give a final answer about what's, what's happened to adenine. I have to repeat this uh, uh, simulation over and over again with the same initial condition, with all the initial conditions, and accumulate statistics to really tell what's happening there. And I did it, and after doing that, I can build the following picture. I have the two conic test sections. I have a re uh, uh, the excited state that he is represented by the green curve. The ground state is represented by the blue curve. And there is, uh, here you have uh, the reaction coordinate, a general reaction coordinate. And the vertical axis is the energy. Dynamics of adenine is mostly following this pathway here, where you have a crossing to the ground state. It goes down and goes there. That happens maybe in 8% of the cases. In the other 20, it goes through the C6 connector section. That was for adenine. And we have uh, done similar simulation, not only for adenine, but for the other nuclear bases I want, a body with the tails. I just want to quickly show you that in the case of guanine, it also goes through a C2 connector section like this. And in a few cases, it accesses a, a C6 connector section for, uh, with oxygen out of plane like this. In the case of a purine, like thymine or uracil, it's very similar. The map, the schematic map is like this. And in the simulation, half of the trajectories that I simulate goes in a way like this, while the other half goes in a way like this. You see there is a complete split. Instead of having a main pathway like in the purines, I have a split between two pathways. This one here goes straight to the ground state. It's very fast. But this one here, it goes to this minimum of the excited state. And from there, it can go either uh, uh, back to that first pathway or cross to the secondary pathway here. So it's a kind of a mess. And if I do the simulation to cytosine, I see quite the same mess as well with several reaction pathways, including one that was this last one here that involves a free state connector section. That's an intersection not between two surfaces, but an intersection between free surfaces. Indeed, this one was here a quite sad case, because when I found it, uh, I think it was 2010, I didn't believe that was for true. I thought that was a mistake of my calculations. And I put it in the drawer, and I started the calculations over trying to, to get it better and explain. Because, come on, free state connector section should be there, shouldn't be there, especially in such a fast uh, time scale as I found. In this meanwhile, while I was repeating my calculations, other groups found the same and published before me. It was too sad. But anyway, we found it first, and then, but I, could, I can't prove that. You see, there's a big difference between the purine and pyrimidines. Why the purine has a single and important time, uh, reaction pathways, pathway, the pyrimidine have several different pathways. And that explains that observation, the experimental observation, that the purine has a single step, while the pyrimidine has multiple steps. And that was a quite nice result to, to understand the difference between uh, those systems, especially because what in principle would be simpler, the pyrimidine that's a smaller molecule, is much more complicated than a bigger molecule like a purine. Um, together with Antonio Carlos Borin uh, from, from USP and Suzanne, uh, Suzanne Ulrich uh, from the University of Georgia, we are just editing a book now, 
that you deal with all this stuff, not only nucleobases, but uh, uh, DNA itself, RNA, so uh, general photo excitation of DNA nucleobases, trying to, to, to analyze several different aspects. You have the really very good specialists in, the, in, in each field that they're contributing, and you are going to see this book coming on in the beginning of 2014. I strongly recommend that you ask your librarian to buy it. So, let me tell you how those simulations were done. I work with surface hopping simulations. In surface hopping, what I try to do is to simulate uh, the propagation of a wave packet. You can do uh, the full propagation of the quantum equations of the wave packet dynamics. So what we do is to propagate classical trajectories. But if I make classical trajectories on a Born-Oppenheim surface, those tra uh, classical trajectories always go over a single surface. But I know uh, from that in a region of a non-adiabatic coupling that the wave packet here, you will split, and then I, ha I, ha I can find my molecule in several different, different asymptotic levels. And I need to take this into account to have a non-adiabatic process. We do that with surface hopping. Every time step, we compute the transition probability. And then a stochastic algorithm decides whether this molecule you will stay in the same surface, or this trajectory will continue in a different surface. If I have a well-balanced surface hopping algorithm, the final number of trajectory in each asymptotic level should correspond to the density of the wave packet in each asymptotic level as well. That's what I want to have. In more technical terms, what we do is, first, to solve the time-independent time Schrodinger equation for a certain nuclear configuration. So that's the conventional quantum chemistry. You take a conventional package like Turbomol, Gaussian games, doesn't matter, and you solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation for a certain nuclear configuration, capital R, to get the potential energy of the ground and excited states, the gradient of the energy, the negative of the force, and also the non-adiabatic couplings, that this, uh, this coupling between the state K and the state J. Having this, we solve the Newton equation on one single Born-Oppenheim surface in one step. You make a numerical integration to get uh, the, the new position. You see that to solve the Newton equation, I need the gradient of the energy. And then, we integrate the, the uh, local approximation for the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. You correct it for the coherence. The equation looks like this without the decoherence correction. You see that to solve it, I need the energies, the potential energies, and I need the couplings, and I need the velocities that came from the previous step. Then I can solve my, for my coefficient c. Having the coefficient c, I can use them to compute the transition probability that's given by this formula here with the fewest switch model developed by, uh, proposed by Tully in 1990. And the C comes here together with the coupling and the velocity. And now that I have the transition probability between the states, I can apply a stochastic algorithm that means to sample, to pick up, to pick a random number, compare this random number to the probability to decide on which surface I should continue my trajectory. This was one step integration. Now I have to repeat every integ this integration till the end of the trajectory and then repeat over several trajectories. The bottleneck for the, for, for the process is step one that may take hours, depending on the molecule. The surface hopping is a method that splits the dynamics into a classical part and a quantum, in a quantum part. The classical part are the nuclei, you, in general, don't need to be, but in general they are the nuclei, and the classical part are the electrons, the fast coordinates. It's used uh, for atomic and molecular collisions 
indeed the origin of the surface hopping was really in this field here. Uh, it was used by physicists to solve collisions of, or, or between atoms and molecules. But since the 90s, it started to be used mostly for molecular photochemistry and photophysics. And nowadays, it starts to be used in condensed phase uh, 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 problems as well, like nanoparticles and so. You can get an overview in this review here that I published a couple of years ago that gives uh, many references that can follow and know more about surface hopping, if you wish. Since 2005, I have been developing together with this group of Giovanni Granucci, Matias Rukenbauer, Felix Plas, Aij Pitner, Maurice Persico, and Hans Lischke, now also Rachel Crespotero that just joined the team, uh, this, this program called Newton X, that's a program for uh, Newtonian dynamics close, uh, close to the crossing seam. The Newton X program is a program specialized in surface hopping dynamics. It's a complete package can, that you can use to do everything for the initial condition generation through the dynamics to the statistical analysis of the results. The program works interfaces to several different programs like Columbus, Tobomol, Gaussian games, and so. And you can make surface hopping dynamics with several different electronic structure methods like MRCI, MCSCF, TDDFT, CC2, ADC2. ADC2 is just coming now in the new, in new, newest version of Newton X. And so the program is open source and freeware. So if you go to newtonx.org, you can just download it and start using. It's very at least from my point of view, it's very easy to use and has a good documentation tutorial. You can really follow and uh, use it. One, sp one specific feature that I like in the program very much is that you can use it to compute, uh, to make simulation of absorption spectrum. You use that in first place uh, to select the initial conditions through a Wigner distribution that looks like this. That's a representation of the ground state wave function projected in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, phase, in a classical phase space that, key, that he used to, to build a set of coordinates and the momenta to be used as in, for initial condition of, of, of the dynamics. You can use these quantities here to make spectral simulation. And that's a side product of the program that's really quite interesting. Because then for every point in your ensemble, you can use an electronic structure method to compute the energies and the oscillator strength to, comp to get the, the, the absorption cross-section. And this absorption cross-section that, that is, is computed through a Monte Carlo uh, integration procedure that can be then compared to the experiments. You can use it not only to get the absorption cross-section, but even ionization cross-section. As in, the example, uh, in this example here, that's a photoionization cross-section of, of uh, trimethylphosphate. That was a collaboration of the group here in, in, in São Carlos, Gustavo, Alejandro, and also Lee and Yvonne, uh, that published uh, uh, last year. You see. It was a, a, it's a quite nice case because in the case of the experiments, they were able to measure from here, that's about 12 EV to higher, uh, to higher energies. And they couldn't do because of the, the, the uh, experimental limitations. Well, in the, in the theory, you could, you, could you could predict from 5 to 16. And both sets of results, the, uh, the theoretical and experimental, they are quite complementary. And I should point out that here you don't have any normalization. Both of them, theory and experiments, they have absolute units in mega barns. So it's really absolute cross sections that are measured and simulated, not relative. You have many challenges in the field. It's not like that you go to the, to the, to the simulations and do whatever you want. No, it's really quite a lot of work. And one of the main uh, troubles is that you have many uh, methods and you have to find a compromise between accuracy and available computational time. You have very fast uh, methods, like semi-empirical methods in this extreme, and you have very 
uh, slow methods like the uh, ab initio MRCI, for instance. Thank you.